Hello, everyone. Whether you're joining us in person here or from the comfort of the virtual world, thank you all for spending tonight with us for this NCAR Explorer Series lecture, the life cycle of an NCAR airborne field campaign flying around the globe to solve the mysteries of the Earth system with Britt Stevens and Corey Wolf. I am Dr. Evie McCumber, and I am an educator here at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, or NCAR. NCAR is a world-leading organization dedicated to understanding Earth system science, including at atmosphere, weather, climate, the sun, and the importance of all of these systems to our society. I am really glad that y'all are joining us as we peek behind the curtains to discuss all of the effort that it takes to bring um, an airborne field project from idea all the way into fruition. For this event, you'll be able to ask Corey and Britt questions at the end of the lecture, and Olia will help moderate so that we can ensure that we hear from y'all as well as from our virtual audience. Um, if you're in person, you can raise your hand and Olia is going to raise to y'all, give you a microphone, and then you can ask your questions. If you're joining us virtually, you can ask your questions using the Slido platform. If you scroll down this web page, if you're virtual, you can see the Slido window just below where you are seeing the live stream video of this event. And this is for all y'all. If you haven't already, please make sure that you are scanning our QR code and join and ask questions if you have them, but make sure to answer our poll questions because that is how we get to engage with y'all. Um, Britt and Corey have some few very fun questions for you, for all of us. So please make sure that you respond on Slido. Um, you can use your phone. If you have a laptop, you can navigate there to slido.com and enter the code hashtag NCARMSR. Uh, and please, please, please make sure that you're adding all of your thoughts to our word cloud question, which is what do you think of when you hear the words airborne field projects? Because Britt and Corey are going to get to that really soon. I don't know what they are, so they're gonna tell me. Um, this event is also being recorded and will be available on the NCAR Explorer Series website. With us today, we have um, NCAR scientists, Britt Stevens and Corey Wolf. Dr. Britt Stevens is a senior scientist at NCAR. He is a leader in research that is focused on developing instrumentation to measure atmospheric oxygen and carbon dioxide, as well as synthesizing data sets and models to track the fate of industrial emissions and feedback to climate change. Over the past two decades, Dr. Stevens has been a principal investigator on a series of global urban surveys of greenhouse gases, and he has maintained a network of mountaintop instruments in the Rocky Mountains, as well as an instrument on a ship that is operating in the Southern Ocean. Dr. Stevens received a bachelor's degree in Earth and Planetary Sciences from Harvard in 1993 and a PhD in Oceanography from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in 1999. Before joining NCAR in 2002, he completed a postdoctoral fellowship with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Carbon Cycle and Greenhouse Gases Group. Corey, um, Corey Wolf is an atmospheric scientist and a project manager in the Earth Observing Laboratory Research Aviation Facility, specializing in managing airborne field campaigns that are geared towards a better understanding of the Earth's atmosphere. His work focuses on supporting scientists in the effective use of aircraft and instrumentation to take observations of atmospheric processes along with overseeing the development of new instruments and methods for improving these observations. Corey has extensive experience developing aircraft payloads, organizing logistics for large groups, and understanding research goals, as well as operational practices. He has managed campaigns not just in the US, but also internationally in Australia, Chile, Costa Rica, and Peru. Um, now that we have all of your thoughts here, uh, I'm going to bring in our speakers so they can just kind of discuss where y'all are with your thoughts on the, what does it mean 
to have an airborne field campaign. I give you Corey and Britt. Just tell me a little bit about what you think about those thoughts that our audience is having about urban field projects. Uh, yeah, they were what I think of, so it's pretty accurate. And, yeah. Um, a few scientists snuck into the audience. Definitely some scientists in there. We saw some <laughs> very technical terms, so yeah. Um, yeah, Overall, I think I, people probably have the basic idea of what it is, but there are a lot of details, and we wanted to share those yeah, with absolutely. you. So if, um, Go ahead. Yeah, I'll start, and yep. then if Corey wants to. Good. The people online maybe not didn't hear that, but that's okay. So uh, thank you very much, Evie. Uh, we're going to tell you about a field campaign we did in 2016 flying around the Southern Ocean, uh, including over the Antarctic Peninsula where this photo was taken, um, based out of Punta Arenas, Chile. 2016 may seem like a long time ago, but we're actually still processing the data and writing papers um, and learning things about the Earth system from this campaign. Uh, and it's really part of a, uh, a long process from the start of getting an idea about what we could go measure to planning and doing it. And then, as I mentioned, writing up all the results. So that's what we wanted to share with you um, to give you a sense of what that process is like. Uh, so I'm, the way this is going to work is I'll talk for about 15 minutes uh, on the science background, um, what I'm interested in as a researcher and why airplanes are really good, um, really good way to uh, answer those questions. Uh, and then I'll hand it off to Corey and he'll talk for 15 minutes or so about uh, how we actually went about doing this, the whole process and what it takes to, to make a, a project like this um, actually happen. Um, there's a, a lot of work involved. Um, not from the scientists, but from everybody else, a huge, huge team of people, um, including Corey. And then I'll come back at the end for another 10 or 15 minutes and tell you some of the things that, we're <clears throat> that we've learned and are, are hoping to learn from future measurements like this. So I study the global carbon cycle, which is essentially the flow of carbon through the atmosphere and the ocean and the terrestrial biosphere, plants, plants on land. Um, and that's really interesting uh, to me and others because concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been increasing um, for the past uh, 100 years or so. Uh, and that, because carbon dioxide traps heat in the atmosphere, is, uh, is causing climate change. Um, this graph is showing measurements made uh, since 1957 at Mauna Loa. And uh, you can use a graph like this with carbon dioxide concentration plotted on the y-axis and, and the year on the x-axis to actually figure out what your CO2 age is. And you know, without dating myself too precisely, I was born when the concentration of CO2 was 325 parts per million. Um, <laughs> my kids' uh, CO2 age is around 380 parts per million. And you know, anyone born today has got a CO2 age of around 420 parts per million. Um, uh, there's actually an online app for that. Uh, if you were born before 1957, let me know, and I can get you some ice core data, and we can <laughs> figure it out exactly how old you are. The, um, the other thing that's really interesting about this to me is that CO2 is only going up about half as fast as we expect it to if all of what we're dumping in the atmosphere stayed there. So this red line is showing how fast the concentration should have increased if everything, all of the um, fossil fuels we burn, gasoline and coal and natural gas, um, produce CO2 that stayed in the atmosphere. So the difference between these two lines is a result of the oceans and the plants on land absorbing some of our emissions. So we know that's been going on for a long time. It's this great free service that uh, the Earth system is providing to us to sort of offset and mitigate um, what otherwise would be uh, um, more severe climate change. But we don't really understand the processes involved in that uptake well enough to say if it's going to continue in the future or if we wanted to only burn a certain amount of gasoline now to hold the concentration at a particular concentration, um, what that amount would be. So that's really the driving um, motivation be behind trying to understand the global carbon cycle. This is um, uh, a cartoon showing some of the numbers. Uh, we have uh, uh, various methods measuring the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, amount of carbon in trees and in the ocean to try and infer some of these things. The um, lines up here are showing numbers in units of gigatons of carbon. Giga is a prefix, which means a billion. So that's a billion tons of carbon. Sometimes you've seen this written as a pedogram, which is actually the same unit. That's a 
quadrillion grams. Uh, it's a lot of carbon. <laughs> a billion tons of anything is a lot. Uh, it turns out every year we're uh, emitting from industrial activities almost 10 billion tons of carbon into the atmosphere. Um, and we know that number reasonably well because we have all these economic statistics on how much fuel is burnt or bought and sold in the, in the international market. Um, a number we also know really well is how fast it's going up in the atmosphere. So only about five uh, billion tons are staying in the atmosphere. We add another one billion from cutting down um, trees and uh, burning them, primarily in tropical areas. So of the 11 that are going in, about six are coming out. And we think uh, around three is going into the land plants and about three is going into the ocean. But the, the, the plus and minus uncertainties on those are, are larger. Um, and if you ask where that's happening um, and why, then the, the uncertainties get even bigger. The reason why these numbers are hard to pin down is because of these skinnier but bigger arrows here that are showing the net exchange with the forests and the ocean. And there, there, it turns out there are these really large balanced exchanges every year because plants grow, about the same amount of plants grow and die every year on land and about the same amount of algae grows and dies every year in the ocean. The ocean also warms and cools, which drives those numbers. So we have you know, around 100 billion tons of carbon going in and out of the land all the time and then we're adding this uh, perturbation to that. So it's trying to measure a small difference and uh, people have been working on it for probably 40 or 50 years and, and there's still a lot of a lot of questions. So we do know that the ocean around Antarctica, the Southern Ocean, is an important carbon sink for, for our emissions. Uh, geographers usually define the Southern Ocean as something like all waters south of 60 south. Scientists usually um, talk about south of 45 south. Uh, and really what makes the Southern Ocean unique is there isn't a barrier of land to prevent the currents from going around. So the winds blow in a circle, which blow the, the ocean currents, and it's um, there's an effect sort of related to the Coriolis effect, but in the opposite direction that causes those waters to then move offshore. So this is a cross section showing the ocean currents um, south of 30 south with latitude on the x-axis and depth on the y-axis. And so the winds are causing the water to be pushed north at the surface, which brings up water from deep. And that deep water hasn't seen the atmosphere for almost a thousand years. Uh, or more, and so it hasn't felt this increase um, from humans burning fossil fuels. So when it comes up, it naturally absorbs CO2 to try and equilibrate with this newer, um, higher concentration. That's indicated by these kind of black arrows in the top that the CO2 we're emitting is slowly absorbing. But um, the reason it's hard to figure out is it's a very complicated system and a lot of other things going on. So for example, the water going north warms up if you've ever set like a soda bottle outside in the sun for a while and tried to open it, you might have noticed it's really fizzy. Um, as water's warm or liquid's warm, they can hold less dissolved CO2. The, and so that makes CO2 and oxygen want to come out of the ocean. Um, and conversely, um, when those waters first come up, they're actually warmer than the air. It's really cold around Antarctica. And so they cool, and that causes CO2 and oxygen to be absorbed by the ocean. At the sa same time, there's a lot of algae that grows during the summer. Photosynthesis draws CO2 out of the air and releases oxygen. Um, and then when all that algae dies and sinks, the opposite happens. Bacteria decompose the organic matter, and they're like us. They consume oxygen and produce CO2. So when those deep waters come up, they have this biological signature of, of um, high CO2 and low oxygen. The, the, the net result of all of these um, arrows moving in different directions can be really hard to figure out. And in fact, the Earth system models um, that we use to project climate change uh, that include a coupling of all of these processes disagree on whether CO2 is actually coming out of the Southern Ocean or going in. So some of them think that this warming effect is dominating and CO2 wow. should come out, and others think that the biology is dominating and CO2 should be going in. So it's an active area of research, and one thing you can do is measure oxygen and CO2 at the same time, and by it, observing whether they're going in the same direction or different directions, you can start to tease out which of these processes are dominating. So one of the ways that we've uh, tried to study the Southern Ocean for a long time is from ships. Uh, Evie mentioned I've had a project. Um, it's no longer running, but it ran from uh, 2012 to 2017, where we were measuring oxygen and CO2 from air collected on this ship called the Lawrence M. Gould. Uh, this ship supports the US Antarctic program. Uh, and 
as you can see from these tracks, it just goes back and forth between Punta Arenas, Chile, and the Antarctic Peninsula, where uh, there's a US research station called Palmer Station. And it's taking biologists down to look at lichen and things, like, and penguins and things like that. But um, we were doing measurements en route to try and use this as a, as a way to sample air. Um, and those results were interesting, but I'm going to show you a couple reasons why it's hard to make, um, hard to do that work and hard to draw clear conclusions. So when we sucked air in from the ship, let me see if I can get my pointer to work. Um, well, let me try and point it here and see if that does anything different. No. Oh, yep. I've got a dot on my screen, but you're not seeing it. So. I will just point with my hand, and hopefully people online can follow along. So the uh, little white thing on top of the mast there is where we were sucking in our air. It's a little shroud to keep the rain out and has a fan to suck air in. So um, see if you can see that little white um, inlet again here in just a minute. A group from Rutgers made a documentary about doing research in Antarctica, and it was... Um, yeah, really, in, you know, uh, dramatic. Um, but what I really liked was the trailer because what I'm going to show you here it goes by kind of quickly, but it's the first few seconds of the trailer. Um, see if you can see that inlet here. <laughs> so, so we ended up sampling a little bit of water um, occasionally. So that's one reason it's really hard to do research in the Southern Ocean. And then uh, the other reason why it's hard to draw clear conclusions is it's a very, um, uh, the, the variability is very high in, in the processes. Uh, this is a picture uh, from satellite measurements from space of chlorophyll over the Southern Ocean. Chlorophyll is the pigment that allows the algae to absorb energy from sunlight. And you can see even averaged over a long period of time, it's really patchy. So some. So if you went out in a ship and did some measurements, it would be very hard to relate it to the entire Southern Ocean because you might happen to be in just one hot spot or one cool spot. So the great thing about making measurements from aircraft is that the air blows across this whole system and sort of averages up the accumulated sum of all of the emissions and uptake of different gases. So it's a really powerful tool to be able to go down and see what the integrated signal is from, from all of the processes underneath. Because of that, the aircraft um, that we maintain here at NCAR are used a lot for studying uh, the carbon cycle and other um, Earth system processes. I was involved in a project, um, uh, an early project to do that with our G5 aircraft, which Corey will tell you more about in a minute. It was called HIPPO. HIPPO stood for the Hyper Pole to Pole Observations Project, and Hyper was kind of the early nickname for our G5 aircraft. Something I hope you get from this talk is that um, in science, it's really important uh, how you pick your acronyms. And <laughs> it's, um, it's, I find it's usually best to pick one that lines up with a charismatic animal. So <laughs> this was the first example of that. So for HIPPO, we took the G5 and we flew here from, in this map you can see from Colorado to uh, Anchorage, Alaska, north to close to the pole, North Pole, then down to Kona. Hawaii, and then somewhere in the South Pacific that varied by campaign, and then to Christchurch, and then uh, as far south as we could get and back. Uh, but we could only get to about 67 south. Um, and while we were flying, we were going up and down the entire time, uh, trying to sample air from different altitudes. So this is what we saw when we did that. These are both maps with altitude on the y-axis, but shown here as pressure. So pressure decreases with altitude. So um, it, it's just sort of a stand-in for altitude. And then latitude on the y-axis with the North Pole on the right and the South Pole on the left. The little gray dots are the flight track of where we flew. And on the left, the colors are showing the CO2 concentration. And on the right, the colors are showing the carbon dioxide, sorry, the oxygen concentration. Um, and we were really interested in what was going on in the Northern Hemisphere. You can see this is in January of 2009, the accumulation of CO2 as a result of fossil fuel burning um, in the Northern Hemisphere associated with industrial activity. And then conversely, there's a drawdown in oxygen because burning things consumes oxygen. Um, but uh, what we also happened to notice was this somewhat surprising result that there was a huge buildup of oxygen at the far southern extent of the flights and what looks like a small drawdown in CO2. And so that got us thinking that, well, this is you know possibly related to southern ocean exchange of oxygen and CO2. and 
even though we only sort of went there one time in summer, uh, maybe if we went back and spent six weeks with the plane, we could really uh, collect a nice data set to, to um, show us what was going on. So that was around 2013, about January 2013, my co-PI, Matt Long, who's a scientist here at NCAR, and I hatched this idea to uh, request the G5 for a study um, out of Punta Arenas. And I'm going to pause here momentarily because I think we had a Slido question related to this. Evie, are you? Oh, you got it. Yeah. And so the question was, how long on average does it take from the idea for an international airborne field project to actually going into the field? So um, seven people guessed three years. So we've got a really smart audience. Um, <laughs> but six people uh, think one year. So you probably like me, you're optimistic. You think um, we can just get the plane and go. I like that. Um, one person said six months, too. That would be awesome. <laughs> um, so uh, if I can go back to my slides, I'll tell you the answer, which is that for us, uh, it took about the average, and that was three years. So we had the initial idea in January 2013, and we ended up flying in January of 2016. And this is everything that that took from spending uh, the first year or so just working with colleagues at a bunch of different institutions shown here. Um, with their logos to uh, develop the ideas for what we might want to do. The plane was not just measuring CO2 and oxygen. It was measuring about 100 other atmospheric species with a lot of other related science questions involved. Um, and so the, the science team included people doing modeling and measurements of other, other gases. Um, and once we sort of had a general uh, plan together, we submitted an overview proposal to NSF, not asking for any money, just saying this is what we want to do. There's a feasibility process that Corey will touch on, a feasibility review process. And then finally, in August of 2014, we were encouraged to proceed to what's considered a full proposal where you ask for all the money to do what you want to do. Um, and then uh, in February, we found out that it would be funded. So we had about a year, which even that is a short amount of time to get something like this together um, before we went out into the field. And the last few months of that, at least for me and other people on the science team, was quite hectic. A lot of late nights trying to put together flight plans and making sure the instruments were working. And I'm going to stop there and hand it over to Corey. And he's going to, I've kind of um, gotten ahead of the game a little bit with my bullets there. He's going to tell right. you more about some of those. Yeah. Thanks, Bruce. Um, so yeah, so now the, the, the project's been funded after about three years. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about how we got to that point and, and then getting into the field. But first, I'll back up just a little bit. So a little bit of background. Uh, Britt and I are at the Research Aviation Facility, which for those of you who don't know, is based at Rocky Mountain Metro Airport in Broomfield. Um, there's a picture of our uh, shiny new building in, uh, that opened two years ago uh, down in the lower left. And then we operate two aircraft. So the, the C-130 is up there in the upper right. Um, pictured there with its brand new eight-bladed props, which just got put on earlier this year. We're, we're very proud of those. Um, and then the Gulfstream 5, so, um, which we'll hear a lot more about because um, uh, that was what was used for orcas. So, um, so backing up a little bit into uh, Britt's bullets, he mentioned kind of a, a feasibility process. So the National Science Foundation um, receives uh, proposals from scientists like Britt who want to use the aircraft to do uh, some sort of scientific research. They decide if it's scientifically a good idea, um, but it comes to us to say, hey, operationally, can you actually do this? And so we uh, go through the feasibility. We look at everything that's been requested. A lot of times, we're talking to the scientists ahead of time, so they're not requesting something super crazy. Um, but then we kind of go through and make sure that it, it can happen. And some of the questions that we're trying to answer are, like with the location, um, can we work there? Is it safe? Have others worked there? That really helps. Um, in the case of orcas, uh, NASA had been down to Punta Arenas a few times, and so we are able to uh, rely on them for some of that support, and they had some uh, uh, contacts in place for us and, and things like that, so that was nice. Uh, do we have places to, how to house everybody? Um, what are the support services? Can we get things there? Punta Arenas is kind of at the end of the world, but you, know, you, can, you can get things there given enough time, um, as we'll hear a little bit about as well. Um, then we look at the flight plans. So what do the scientists want to do with the planes? Um, is it uh, you know, something that, that can be done with the G5? It's got like a 5,000 mile range. It can technically go to like 50,000 feet. But once you start putting a payload on, that really starts to, to cut down a little bit, as you, might, as you might imagine. And so 
Uh, sometimes we have to rein that in just a little bit, but um, eventually we found that what Britt wanted to do was, was feasible with the aircraft, um, probably after a little bit of negotiation, but um, that's usually how it goes. And then uh, we gotta look at the payload. What kind of instruments do they want to put on there? Um, if you know scientists, you know they wanna take every single measurement they possibly can, so usually when things come in, it's a little bit oversubscribed. Even on the C-130, it's a giant aircraft, but we often get requests that are just not going to fit on there. So you have to kind of go back and forth, maybe make some recommendations on uh, what can fit, what can't, and what can still make you uh, reach your scientific goals. Um, and then also another concern is the weather. And this came up in Punta Arenas. Uh, there's a lot of wind down there, so we had to be aware of that and knew that it could cause some problems. We were not gonna have a, a hangar for the G5, so we had to be um, a little bit uh, careful with you know, when we left it outside, or when, when it was there, if the winds got too high, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. Um, what are those impacts? How do we mitigate some of those risks? We're going to study um, you know, sometimes some fairly bad weather. Sometimes that overtakes us a little bit, and so we have to be ready for those too. So those are some of the questions that, that we ask when we're going through this, among some other ones too, but those are kind of the main ones. So now the project's been funded, we start working on putting the instrumentation on board. So here's a picture of the G5 when it was um, uh, ready, for, ready for orcas. Um, so you see it looks like a fairly normal um, jet, except when you look a little closer, you see there's a lot of things sticking out of it, a lot of things hanging off the wings. Um, so starting in the upper right, we've got um, probes that, that we hang off the wings. Whoops, I should not use the mouse for that. So I'll just come out here. Probes that we hang off the wings, um, those are mostly used for uh, studying uh, cloud uh, properties, so they, measure, they take two different measurements of uh, sizes of cloud particles. There's also another one there that'll tell us how much liquid water is in the cloud. Um, so we put those on the wings so they're um, away from the airflow. We're not trying to bring that into the cabin um, because that would be pretty difficult with, with water droplets. But then we also have these um, inlets that are on the plane, and here's some that are hanging off the bottom a little bit of a, of a close-up view, and there's a bunch more on the top. Um, because this was a chemistry campaign, and as Britt uh, explained, they were very interested in the constituents in the air. So to do that, you have to somehow bring air into the cabin. Well, we can't just roll down a window and you know, bring some in, it's not, not gonna work. So we have inlets that are speci uh, specially made to <clears throat> bring that air in um, into tubes. It comes into the cabin, into instruments that look like some of these, and it goes through a series of maybe reactions, maybe it goes through some lasers, um, things like that, and they're able to pull out what those constituents are then that air is exhausted out the back, and um, it's all done in, within the pressure vessel, so there's no, uh, no opening to the outside or anything like that. So that's what all those inlets are doing. So on the inside, we've got these racks that we call them that hold the instruments, and they're full of computers and tubes and cables and all sorts of complicated things, and we fill the cabin with those, and that's kind of what you're seeing there. So this is kind of when we were developing the payload, um, you know, making sure everything's gonna fit on there, making sure we have seats for people to fly, um, there's a scientist there on the, on, laying on the floor, we see this quite often, working on something underneath where the, maybe an inlet had come loose or something like that. This was not in flight, by the way. This was on the ground. Um, and uh, you know, making some adjustments on, on, a, on a maintenance day. So that, that's part of, the, part of the process, is getting the instrumentation put on, figuring out what instruments are gonna go, and then making it all work. Um, another thing we're coordinating as we go is uh, shipping. As you can see, we do not travel light. Um, Depending on the payload size, we might bring a couple different 20-foot sea containers with us that have aircraft equipment, but also a lot of scientific equipment. Um, there's spares, and there's tools, and there's consumables. And so we have to coordinate getting all that to where we need to go. So we will send these, in the case of an international project like ORCAs, these, uh, these containers might leave a few months before the project. So they're, hopefully, they're waiting for us um, when we get there, and everyone has their support equipment that they need, and we can get right into uh, to doing things. We can carry some things on the plane, and we do, but we're not carrying that much, obviously. So um, that's another thing that we need to uh, worry about coordinating. So there's a lot of, um, also a lot of project planning. So to get that payload on, so this is January of 2016, the plane left, um, what, around the 11th. Um, two months before that, in November of 2015, we started putting things on the aircraft and installing those racks and those instruments like you saw and each one takes a few days to kind of make sure it's on there. They run tests and everything, make sure it's there. So starting a couple months ahead, we're putting instruments on the plane. We're also taking a crew of, in the case of orcas, I think probably 40 to 50 people um, into the field. And we're going to a place that probably most people have never been. We take a lot of students, grad students. This might be their first field campaign. So we also try to make it 
you know, we don't want to just send them down there and say, good luck, you know, have fun. So we put together, you know, we do a lot of uh, legwork to um, go down. We do site surveys to these places, figure out, you know, where we're going to stay, uh, what are the support needs of people, and give them an orientation package. And I'll just show, um, just talk about a, a little bit about what we put together. Um, Chile requires, in some countries, require a visa to get in. So you have to apply for that ahead of time. So people need to be aware. Um, we found out that uh, most cars that you rent down there are manuals. So we wanted to tell people, if you're going to rent a car, make sure you know how to drive a stick, you know, that sort of thing. Sometimes there are sp specific uh, driving rules that people need to know. When we've gone to Australia, just a reminder, you're on the other side of the road, that sort of thing. So um, stuff like that. The lodging, we usually set up a hotel where everyone, the, the entire project can stay at. So we'll tell them a little bit about the hotel and what to expect there um, and whatnot. So just to, to help them out a little bit. We talk a lot about safety. Um, like I said, some of these folks have never really been around an airport or been out on the airfield, so we want to make sure that uh, they, they understand the rules of not only the airports in the U.S., but any specific rules of airports in the country where we're going. So um, talk to them a little bit about that. And then also just kind of tell them, where are we going to be? So this is a picture of the Punta Arenas Airport. And so we were able to tell folks, okay, when you drive in, um, when you come in, you're going to park here. We have a little operations center in the old terminal, which is the, the building there where we'll have some equipment, we'll have some workspace, uh, things like that. We know the G5 is probably gonna be parked over here most of the time, so we'll walk out uh, to get to the aircraft. The containers that I talked about that hold a lot of our stuff, they're gonna be over here in this lot. So that kind of gives people a little bit of, a, of an idea of where, um, where they need to go um, and, and hopefully orient them so when they show up, they've got an idea of, of what's happening. Um, a lot of the instruments uh, require consumables such as uh, nitrogen or compressed air, or in this case, we had one that required liquid nitrogen. So we also have to make sure that we can get some of these on site. Luckily, the US polar programs had liquid nitrogen. Um, they, they were able to make it on their ships um, down there in Punta Arenas, so we were able to get liquid nitrogen from them. The airport was not a big fan of us keeping liquid nitrogen in this building, so they gave us a little shed where we were storing liquid nitrogen, so we wanted to, to point that out as well. Um, and then they were able to go out there and, and fill it. A couple other things we have to think about in foreign countries is diplomatic clearances. The aircraft are government owned, they're government uh, aircraft, so we can operate as state aircraft. So we work with the US embassies in the countries we go to, submit a diplomatic clearance request, they take it to that country, um, get us cleared so we can operate as a state aircraft there, and that takes some, uh, obviously some coordination as well. Um, we also arrange for some on-site support. We don't have a lot of Spanish speakers on staff, and so uh, we thought it'd be helpful to have somebody who was a local there who could um, you know, translate for us, uh, had some local connections where we needed some help. And so in this case and in other times we've gone to uh, Latin America, we have made arrangements to have somebody who's just kind of there to, to, to make sure we're not doing anything too crazy um, and, and able to uh, help us speak with the locals. So that's kind of everything that goes into the preparation. So we've got a payload on the plane. We've got all everything ready. People have their airline tickets booked, and um, now it's time to go into the field. So astute observers might notice that we did this project in January, but that doesn't look like January on the front range. You're correct. That's from a different project, but it was the only video I had. So. <clears throat> So we get to the field. Um, in general, we usually have um, an operations center. This one happened to be at the, the hotel. And what that is, it's a, it's a place to come together that we set up um, high-speed internet. We have printers. We have uh, screens. And we would have daily planning meetings. And that's where the science team and operations would all come together and make plans for the next day. Um, determine, hey, what scientific goals have we reached? What do we still need to do? What should the next flights look like? Um, we would get a forecast from uh, one of, the, one of the, the forecasters that we had on the team and make a determination on, are we going to fly tomorrow? If so, where are we going to fly? What are the flight plans going to look like? And um, come, up with, come up with that. So um, there, was, there was these daily meetings where the, next, uh, the plan for the next day were made as far as, um, as far as what the flights were going to look like. So they've met in this room. They've you know, come up with a flight plan, Britain, the science team. And then they, they need, so, and they've told the pilots, we want to make a flight that goes to A, B, and C, and we're going to go to these altitudes. And this takes us to the next um, Slido question, where we asked, where do, what, how does the altitude for one of, for one of our research aircraft, and I'm talking about the G5, 
compared to the altitude of commercial flights that fly that usually around 35,000 feet. So most people said research flights fly at higher altitudes. Some said they fly at the same altitude, and some said commercial flights are actually higher and the G5 is lower. This was a bit of a tr trick question because the answer is all three. <laughs> so uh, we can go back to the presentation, please. So this was an example of a flight plan that was um, submitted. So uh, Punta Arenas is up there in the upper right. They're going to fly down here to the south, then come back up, and then, and then head back. So that's just the, the general um, aerial view of that. Here's the altitude view. So you can see they took off. They did start at like 40,000 feet, so higher than a commercial aircraft. Dipped down a little bit to do some instrument uh, calibrations, I think, um, or do some remote, uh, a little bit of remote sensing and some upper air transect. And then stayed up there, but then all of a sudden went down and we didn't quite go to zero, but it's very close. We were down often at uh, two to 300 feet off the, off the ocean surface, and then coming back up and going back down, and then started to do some, some higher ones as well. So started off high, went through the altitudes, but then did a lot of it low, and then transited back high. So we often do, um, this is a lot of what our research, plane, uh, research flights look like, is it's very rare for us to go out, stay at one altitude, and then come back and land. There's almost always lots of altitude changes because one of the most useful things you can do is to get a full, um, full transect of the, uh, of the atmosphere, and um, the, the planes are very good at helping, helping them do that. So, so we've planned our flights. We're ready to go. Um, here's our pilots heading out to the G5 the morning of uh, one of our flights. This actually shows all the flights we did during ORCAs, so that we did 19 research flights. Punta Arenas is kind of right in the middle where they all come together. Um, you can see all the areas that, that we went to, even up the coast of Chile a little bit, out over Argentinian waters as well. Um, we flew 98 flight hours. All the planning was done. We're in the field. It's all unicorns and rainbows, right? <laughs> I wish. Um, it would make my job a lot easier. Um, some of the issues, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not all just fun. We do have some issues that we run into. Um, for orcas, we did run into shipping delays. One of those sea containers I talked about, we sent it very early. It showed up about a week after we got there. We knew it was going to be late, so we were able to throw some extra things into the G5 to kind of help us out. But it did set us back a little bit um, as far as uh, reaching, uh, you know, having spares on hand and things like that. And, and we were missing some important items uh, for the first uh, flight or two. Um, sometimes weather. Um, I mentioned the winds in Punta Arenas. There's a couple times that they, they got too high. Uh, for what the G5 could be outside in, and we had to evacuate uh, up to Puerto Mont, which is about two hours up the coast. Um, we've also been on projects where we got too much snow and the airfield was closed, so we just had to wait for, for that to, to melt or get cleared off. Um, so yeah, those types of things happen. Um, you remember from the cabin pictures, those instruments, they're very complicated. Sometimes they have problems, as you might expect. So sometimes those set us back a little bit, and there has to be some days for repairs. Um, I will say Brit's instruments are spectacular and never fail. Did I say that right? Is that good? Okay, yeah, that's good. Uh, so <clears throat> it's always it's, it's everybody else. Um, and then also the aircraft are complicated, and they sometimes have issues. Um, we didn't have, I don't think we had major issues with the G5 here, but there are some repairs that need to be done. We have had to take the aircraft back home for some repairs in the middle of a field project. That's not a that's not good times, but um, it does happen. And then, you know, obviously, uh, COVID has wreaked havoc on some of our field campaigns. We shut down in 2020. We got back to doing them in 21, but since then, we've had to be very uh, aware of it. We've had people get get uh, COVID well on field campaigns, and so dealing with that. So that's been uh, something new that's that's kind of come up as well. So. One of the important things we do in the field is education and outreach. So we, uh, with our education coordinator for ORCAs, we put together these postcards. Um, both sides were done in English and Spanish so that when people stopped by the airport or checked in this on the hotel or when we had our media day, we were able to hand these out and kind of tell them what we were doing. Um, the media did come visit us and we got a write-up um, in a Chilean paper about what was happening with the, uh, with the project, which was, which was nice. And we had a couple of grad students on this project who were um, down there. I think they were both from CU. And they actually got to plan and execute one of the, one of the missions. So they were like the mission scientists on board. And they got to you know, put the flight plans together and, and work with the pilots on that. So um, really good experience for them. So that was really nice. Um, sometimes everything comes together at once. And so in the, down by the Antarctic continent was the, the Gould, right, the, the research vessel. And it had some instruments on it that were similar to the G5, and they wanted to do some intercomparisons. And um, it needed to be clear, which it is on this day. So we've got our ship sitting down there, and it's clear. 
were ready to go. The problem was the G5 had evacuated the night before, and it was sitting in, in Port Amont. And at the time, we didn't correlate it, but um, this kind of shows the wind. So I think this happened around uh, February 9th when we had max wind gusts over 60 miles an hour. So that's why the plane was gone. Um, we correlated it around this time that when the winds were strong in Punta Arenas, it was because a storm system had just gone through and it cleared out the clouds kind of all over the place. And that's why it was. So we realized that we were only going to get clear skies here when it was windy, very windy in, in Punta Arenas. So Britt came up with a plan to let's fly the plane back from Puerto Montt, have a flight plan ready for the pilots, and they can flight plan, we'll get the instruments ready to go, and then we'll go catch the ship all in the same day, which was a bit um, aggressive. In the middle of that, <laughs> Britt had also, uh, Britt had also uh, said that he would do a Google Hangout with some graduate students, or a, a class at the University of Michigan, if I'm not mistaken, and that was planned for around the same time that the G5 was gonna get back and couldn't really be moved. So, we had a clear ship, we had a plane that was evacuated, and Britt was uh, talking to students at the same time. So luckily there was other people in the field who could help plan the flight, other people who could take the flight, and at the end of the day, um, we made it happen, and here's a picture of the G5 flying from the ship flying by, though we did almost get into some clouds with it, so we, we, just, we just made it. Um, so sometimes you just have to try to you know, be flexible in the field, make sure you can do what you do, not break your crew duty day, we have to stay you know, we can't work people all night and all day and, and whatnot, so we have to uh, be aware of that too. But this worked out and I think it was a really good uh, flight. I can't remember which research flight this was, but it was um, very useful to the team. So I'll just end by saying we work hard while we're in the field. Um, there's a lot going on, a lot to do, but we do get the occasional day off and we try to take advantage of it because we're in some really cool locations. So in Chile, there's a, there's a shot of Punta Arenas with a nice rainbow on it. We get to see some cultural activities that are going on. Um, Patagonia is not too far away, so some of us were able to drive up and see some of the um, amazing scenery there. Um, and so, and that kind of happens at everywhere we go. We're in the field for at least three weeks, usually, at a time. And so you kind of start to get a feel for where you're at and you really want to uh, take advantage of everything. And if you saw the, um, the preview video, you know that I promised penguins, so I do want to show. So there's a couple different types of penguins in uh, South America, the, the Magianic ones and the king penguins. And so. People were able to go see them as well, and uh, you know that's another, another fun thing we got to do. I've never seen a penguin before in, in, in the wild until this trip. So, and now I will turn it back over to Britt to talk about some of the results we got from from this project. Okay. So, yep, and you're going to start this right. Here. I'll take that. So the first thing I'm going to do is show you a video from uh, that flight that. Corey showed the flight plan um, of. And so uh, while the video, the, so we have a camera that hangs out on the wings. So this will be a forward looking uh, shot. And then there's gonna be a, uh, a map at the top right corner. You can just see a red dot there that'll show the location of the aircraft. And then a graph showing some of the measurements. So in red will be the oxygen concentration. And in blue will be the carbon dioxide concentration. And then there'll be a gray line showing the altitude of the plane. Um, so you can decide if you wanna just watch the movie or if you want to think about the graph as well. So here we go, we're taking off from Puderenas and the plane climbs, climbs through some uh, wet clouds and uh, the lens of the camera actually ices over. So um, you can see this little circle of, of ice slowly ablates and all of a sudden it gets clear as the plane's climbing up and it's done this um, sort of down and up that Corey mentioned we were trying to sample um, some of the upper atmospheric features. And then as we're going across uh, Drake Passage now, I can tell you this is the way to do it, not in an oceanographic research vessel. <laughs> uh, instead of it taking four days and, and being seasick, it takes um, you know four hours. So uh, now we're starting our descent to the uh, what ends up being the ice edge at this time of year, where if you remember that picture of chlorophyll, it's quite productive. And what's going to happen here, I'm just going to let it run for a few more um, seconds, is that both oxygen and CO2 come up as we initiate the descent, and that has to do with coming out of the stratosphere, which is the upper um, part of the atmosphere that's separated from, from recent influence from the surface. But now I wanted to ask if people had any guesses as to which way oxygen were going to go. So at, I, at this time, we didn't know whether 
the flights we'd done on Hippo were just kind of a one-off, um, and we were going to see something completely different. You know, which models might be right or wrong. So. Um, you can think in your head, or maybe I'll ask people to show of hands, who thinks both oxygen and CO2 are just going to keep on going up as we go down? Anyone? Anyone? Um, okay, and uh, they, are they both going to reverse direction? Anyone think they'll both reverse direction? Um, does anyone think oxygen will keep going up and CO2 will go down? See a few hands there. Janine's got her fingers crossed. Okay, let's let it play and we'll see. Um, see what actually happens here. So it's exciting when you're out there and you don't know the answer and you're actually on the, whoops, sorry, the mouse control is a little touchy on the touchpad, but I think we'll get there. Okay, here we go. Um, so yeah, we, we also get, okay, so now you see the gray line coming down and Oxygen keeps going up, and the blue line, CO2, is reversed, and it goes down. And then here we are along the coast of, or at least the ice edge, uh, along the peninsula. And we're gonna, the plane's going to turn around, and then I'll just let it play. I won't stop it again. It's going to um, do a, this series of what we call porpoises between um, about 500 feet and 5,000 feet. And if you look closely, um, every time the plane goes up and down on one of these porpoises shown by the gray line, the, the, the red and the blue lines are also wiggling. And yeah, we were always, you know, checking out all the scenery and everything else. And I forgot to mention, this is sped up. This is <laughs> <laughs> hours on the x-axis, so we didn't actually fly that fast. Um, but as, so as the plane goes north and we start to do these um, larger transects, um, you can see what happens with the gases. The other thing I wanted to mention is that um, the experience of flying along on a plane like this is you're sort of inside the instrument, um, if you think of the whole plane as the scientific instrument. And one thing you notice is that when you get down into the lower most layer, what we call the boundary layer, it gets really bouncy. And that's it's the boundary layer because it's what's uh, feeling the influence of the surface, and it's feeling it through turbulence. So um, that turbulence is also mixing up the air, and so you can uh, you can see um, the influence of, of exchange with the ocean. So when you're flying down in the airplane, it's really smooth, and all of a sudden it starts bumping, and if you're watching on a laptop with your instrument, you can see as soon as it starts bumping, the gases all go in different directions, and that tells you, you know, so right then and there you sort of have... Um, a really good idea of what the scientific result is going to be. And of course, it takes um, years later to actually get it all written up. But um, you can see we did these large transects coming back to the north, and we saw the same thing, where when the plane was down low, the CO2 concentrations were lower, and the opposite for oxygen, so CO2 was higher. We were chasing a, sort of chasing a buoy. Our program manager from NSF also funded these measurements on a buoy out in the middle of the Southern Ocean. And, it would really be impossible to actually find a buoy out there from an airplane, and, and, and the wind is blowing by, so they, it's, you don't, can't really relate the aircraft to something in one particular spot, but we thought we would go fly over it just for, for his sake. Um, and then we turned and came back to, came back to Punta Arenas. And so um, uh, this is us landing after the flight. Uh, you can see the landing gear have come out. And this uh, signal of uh, CO2 being low near the bottom of the profiles and oxygen being high near the bottom of the profiles um, really confirmed this hypothesis that biology was dominating the, the exchange going on. So um, algae growing during the summer, taking up CO2 was having a much bigger effect than the sun warming the ocean, which would have um, had CO2 going the other direction and, and oxygen going in the same direction as CO2. So that really was one of the primary results from this study was that, um, that biology was um, was really important for what's happening during summer over the Southern Ocean. And of those climate models, Earth system models I mentioned that were thinking CO2 was coming out of the ocean at this time of year, we're sort of able to say that, you know, they have a problem and need, need some work and that the other ones that got CO2 in going in were more accurate. Um, the other result I wanted to talk about that was uh, surprising to us was the strength of the CO2 uptake signal. So we had, um, I mentioned we didn't really know what was going to happen as we were coming down. We had one of the 
KPIs on the team was predicting CO2 was just gonna be flat everywhere. We weren't gonna see any gradients at all. That was a valid prediction based on some of the ocean, some of the shipboard measurements. But in fact, we saw this huge drawdown of CO2 uh, at the lower altitudes and at uh, further south we got. So this is another one of these cross-section plots with altitude on the left and latitude on the bottom, and it's now stuck into Google Earth, so you can see where it is in the real world. And it's showing the average CO2 concentration from the entire six weeks of flying around. Uh, and one of the things that we you know, realized when we were out there is that we were actually measuring air that was less than 400 parts per million, whereas there had been a bunch of sort of news headlines when the concentration at Mauna Loa had gone past 400, and it was sort of this milestone that people, people uh, thought was sort of interesting. But we were down here in the southern hemisphere, which sort of feels the influence of all of the pollution a year or so later, so there was still a little bit of air that was below 400. So there was a little news thing about how we were sampling the sort of last gasp of sub 400 ppm air. But this gradient going from around 401 to something like 398, three parts per million, was, was much larger than we had expected. And so uh, we inferred from that that the uptake of CO2 by the ocean was much stronger than we had expected. But uh, before we could kind of you know just run out and publish a paper saying that, um, we had to put it into a larger context. And that larger context included some other studies that were going on at the same time. And one of those, also funded by NSF, was a project um, led by Princeton University to put around 200 robotic floats into the Southern Ocean. So this is a picture of one of these robotic floats. It's about the size of a scuba tank. And this map shows where they've put them in and where they go. They go down to... Um, about 2,000 meters below the surface and drift around for a week and then they pop up, do a bunch of measurements and pop back down again. And they last for a couple of years before the batteries run out. And this, they don't measure CO2 directly, they measure pH, which is uh, rela related and, and from which you can, you can infer CO2. And when they did all those calculations, they found that the floats were suggesting that CO2 was actually coming out of the Southern Ocean and not just um, a little bit, but a lot. And so the, the, their result received a lot of attention. This was one article um, titled, Ship-Based Measurements Overestimate Southern Ocean Carbon Sink. And this graph shows in brown what the floats were implying in terms of outgassing something like 0.3 billion tons of carbon coming out of the Southern Ocean, whereas the previous measure, measurements from ships were thinking around 0.4 was going in. So this was kind of a, uh, a controversial result at the time. And we thought, you know, something had to be wrong. but um, in order to really um, be sure of, you know, of, of our result, uh, what we needed to do was relate the concentration measurements we'd made in the atmosphere to an actual rate of uptake by the ocean. So to do that, to turn, say, a vertical gradient of 3 ppm into an estimate of the flux requires um, a lot of work with computer models. So we end up using uh, Earth system models, the same ones that are used to project climate change, as well as models that are just of the atmospheric winds blowing around. This is a cartoon depicting uh, conceptually what these models are like. They divide the entire planet up into little boxes, and then there are equations relating all of the different um, constituents between and, uh, and, and physical processes between boxes. So in the case of a model that's just representing the atmosphere, you can tell it what the winds are, and it will blow all the CO2 and oxygen around, and you can tell it how much CO2 or oxygen is coming in or out of the ocean. Uh, these models, uh, at least in our case, are often run at the NCAR Wyoming Supercomputer Center up in Cheyenne, which um, some may have seen or uh, if people are interested uh, can go up and visit as well. Uh, this is an example of, of output from one of these simulations run by uh, Matt Long, my Orcas co-PI, uh, and it's showing um, the concentrations of CO2 in the upper right and oxygen in the lower left in the atmosphere at the surface of the Earth, and then as a sort of the slice in the background, an average of what the vertical cross-section looks like, as if you took a slice through the atmosphere. Um, and this is also a movie, so I'll let it uh, play for a minute, and you can see the winds, the little swirls here, you know, that's what we experience when we have weather, you know, that's all the mid-latitude storm systems blowing around. And in the same way that those can bring a lot of moisture from the south or cold air from the north, they also mix CO2 and oxygen. Um, so this, right now, you can see the date in the top. This is summer in the northern hemisphere, winter in the southern hemisphere, and this is just the impact of the ocean. So we've turned everything else off in the model. 
And you can see the ocean in the north during the summer is giving off oxygen and is productive. And then the southern ocean is uh, taking up oxygen because uh, it's cooling and we have this respiration signal. But now it's coming on to summer and all of a sudden you have this sort of big bloom that happens and all of the algae going produces oxygen and consumes CO2. This uh, runs right up until about when the field campaign happened. So this is um, January of, let me see if I can, yeah, stop it there. This is now February of 2016, and you can see a huge um, increase in oxygen around the Southern Ocean and a de depletion in CO2, you know, very consistent with what we saw from the aircraft in the real world. Uh, and, but the trick with the, the great thing about the model is we know exactly what the um, emission of, of oxygen was from the ocean and exactly what the uptake was. So because we know everything in the model, we can start to build a relationship between the concentration gradients where, that you would measure in the atmosphere and what the actual rate of exchange with the ocean is. And we ended up using um, multiple models. We had uh, um, around 12 different models contributed by colleagues so we could get a handle on sort of the uncertainty on these relationships and really establish uh, what the what the uptake was. Um, get this to go to the next slide. Uh, and this was the result, which was that CO2, in fact, was going in uh, stronger than we expected. And we were able to show that convincingly enough, and it was an interesting enough result that it was published in the journal Science uh, in 2021 and was one of their featured articles. And that result is now shown on the right, where, again, this uh, implied outgassing from the floats is in brown and this new result from the aircraft is uh, in black and it's even more uptake than we thought we were seeing from the ship. So one big takeaway conclusion from this study was that something must be wrong with the floats. And one catch with the floats is they chuck them in the ocean and they can never calibrate them again. So there's something could be happening um, uh, and, they wouldn't, and they wouldn't know. So there's a lot of work now looking into that and trying to figure out how to maybe catch up to the floats or follow one for longer. And, and really digging into that um, calculation between pH and CO2, which has some uncertainty as well. Uh, but the second big kind of takeaway from this study was that the best way to measure the CO2 exchange with the Southern Ocean is not from ships or robotic floats, but from aircraft. And so with that you know, in mind, we started thinking about where, where we might want to go and do this next. And so I'm going to stop there. I think there's another Slido question related to that, we asked you where you would go with, um, if you had a private jet full of scientists, <laughs> pilots, technicians, engineers, and scientific instruments at your disposal, where would you go? So we thought somebody might say they would drop the scientists at the earliest uh, opportunity <laughs> and then go somewhere. But um, I saw, oh, Antarctica. There we go. Who said that? Can I, or maybe it was a virtual participant. Did you say Antarctica? That, that's what I said, too. Um, all right, hubs uh, and subjects, known big yeah, very cool. Some great idea, ideas, and all of those would be interesting. Um, I decided I wanted to try and do this, uh, if we can go back to the presentation, um, more routinely than once every you know six years or 10 years or however long. So I um, wrote another proposal to NSF to try and get an instrument on the aircraft that are operating in support of the Antarctic program. These planes are called LC-130s, so they're different from RC-130 in that they have skis on them, as you can see in this top right picture. Um, and they fly from Christchurch, New Zealand to McMurdo Station, which is due south uh, on the Antarctic coast, and then on to the South Pole. So this project we called the Southern Ocean Carbon Gas Observatory, or SCARGO. <laughs> which is probably why it got funded. Um, <laughs> and we, uh, we had a lot of difficulties getting uh, approval from the Air Force to put this um, instrument on the air. The planes are um, run by the New York Air National Guard um, for historic reasons. They f support the Antarctic program and the a program in Greenland with these aircraft. Uh, but you have to get everything approved through the Air Force. So that took a while, and then we ran into COVID and had lots of other delays. But last November and December, we were able to do a short uh, test season. Um, and this is a picture of our instruments in this uh, instrument rack on the left side of the plane. And while the plane is carrying a whole new crew of uh, Air National Guard folks down to, to work on the ice. 
Um, so that's uh, hopefully ongoing uh, for the next uh, three years or so, and then we'll be able to find out more uh, in terms of the, the variability from one year to the next in terms of in, in the uptake uh, of CO2 um, and exchange of other gases around, around Antarctica. And then the last slide I had was just another fun one of people uh, in the field, and you know most of the pictures I have, people are smiling. Um, and I think that's because it is fun to be out there on these campaigns. Um, you're getting to um, uh, engage with the science you know, on a daily basis. The, uh, these are pictures of some of my co-PIs, Matt Long there. I didn't have a picture of him um, on the plane. You might think that the two PIs are always in a restaurant you know, <laughs> drinking beer while everyone else is working. But um, this is after a really hard, hard day. Um, and we like to show this picture to our oceanographer friends, because when they go out, they're stuck for two months. Uh, in a boat, but we get to come back to Punta Arenas and relax. Um, Ralph Keeling, another uh, PI, is kind of imitating uh, Maverick from Top Gun in the flight planning session there. Um, Colm Sweeney, Janine. Um, yeah, cameo. Um, a couple of our pilots, they, they're smiling anytime they're in the plane and getting the full eye, so that's pretty typical. Eric Court, uh, Mackenzie Smith, who was at University of Michigan, now she's in Boulder. Uh, a bunch of our technicians and mechanics who keep the plane flying safely and all the instruments running. And Sue Schoffler, who was swapping out some uh, canisters for sampling um, a bunch of reactive species. So I'll stop there. Thank you all for your attention. And I think we have some yes, questions and answers. Yes, yeah. let's just give them a hand first. We will do it by doing one question in the room if we have it, and then some of the virtual ones. So if you have a question in the room, this is your chance to Should start it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you can sit, and then Olia will manage it. Questions? Ha-ha. What's the difference between a project and a campaign? Oh, man. I wish I, I, wish I knew the answer to that question, because, because we we will call something a project, and then everyone else will call it a campaign. And we had this, is that me? That's not me, is it? Not here. Oh, sorry, it's not me. It's not here. It's um, no, it's a great question, and it's really hard with these things, like, but that's, that's not that one either. With the HIPPO project, we did five, what I, I call campaigns, over a period of four years. And then the whole thing was a project, but then everyone calls it the HIPPO campaign, and then they don't know what to call the individual one. So yeah, I think, you know, I don't know. What, we tend to use them interchangeably, I yeah. think, a lot of times, yeah. So Yeah, whereas the project might include maybe the modeling and every, the lab work and everything else, whereas the campaign is maybe going out. Going out. I, yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> it is a problem. <laughs> yeah. Corey, is your mic on? It is. Showing green. You can take one in the room, yeah. How nauseating were those profiles from the G5 altitudes down to 200 meters and it's windy down there? And how, how, how did you guys survive that? Or was it fine? It <laughs> looks really nauseating to me. I didn't take any of those flights, but I've been on, I've been on ones that have, have done that. And um, yeah, it, it gets a little rough, especially at the bottom. Um, and when you're in cloud, um, it's, but. You take some medication. <laughs> you know, yeah. take, the, take the Dramamine. Yeah. The, the nice thing about these is the vast majority of the flight, you're not in the boundary layer. So it's really smooth. And yeah. you can get up and walk around and chat with someone and have a coffee and not spill it all over yourself. And then it's just kind of for a few minutes, you drop down and it's bumpy. And um, the, um, I will say that the C 130 probably it spends more time in the boundary layer. Um, it's a lower flying aircraft. And that one gets really really rough sometimes. So yeah, the G5 is a little bit smoother overall. Yeah, I would say the most flights, no one is getting sick on the G5. Most flights, somebody's getting sick on the C1. <laughs> that's, that's probably true, yeah. <laughs> we did a project here in Colorado flying around in the C130, and that was, yeah. Yeah, it was a pollution was study really on the front range, and so they just wanted to stay low on hot days in the summer over, over Denver, and it was, um, not good times for a lot of people, but <laughs> but the data set was really good. So yeah. <laughs> All for science, exactly. Okay. We have a question online from Slido. Let's just bring it up. Ooh, this is a question from Bernadette. Um, she wants to know if you have to be a scientist to go on these field campaigns. 
I love this question, this is great. Um, so the answer is no. Um, like I said, we took, for ORCAs, we probably took 40 or 50 people into the field. Um, I would say half of them were probably scientists, but the other half were obviously pilots. We had maintenance uh, mechanics for the aircraft. We have instrument technicians. We have software engineers, um, you know, project, project managers. Um, uh, we, take, uh, we take all types because it takes more than just scientists to run the instruments, process the data, um, and, and things like that. So um, where, I, where we work out at RAF, we're like 35 people. There is a science team, but we have a wide variety of different job types out there, um, just the, the ones I mentioned. And so uh, it's kind of open, open to everybody, uh, which, is, which is really nice. So we get a lot of people having great experiences that aren't scientists, so right. yeah. Okay. Hi, um, I'm just curious that all the research is being done like in that southern you know, hemisphere down there, way down there in the southern ocean. I mean, what about the rest of the globe? Like, why is so much work done just in that one little part of the globe? Um, I'm, yeah, I think maybe we were focused on it here, and maybe you've heard more about it because it's an exciting and interesting place to work. But there actually is a lot more um, work done in the northern hemisphere because that's where you know the countries are that can afford to fund science agencies. So in terms of measuring carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, if I had put up a, a network map, it's, you know, 100 sites in the Northern Hemisphere and maybe you know 10 or 20 in the Southern Hemisphere, there's usually a bias the other way that a lot more is done in the North. The questions are you know, sometimes different. We, work, we try to look at air pollution um, more in the North because that's where all, a lot of the cities are, although it's also an issue in the South. Um, for oceanography, there's a lot of interest in um, the Northern Oceans as well. So yeah, I think... Um, I'm usually trying to make the opposite case that, oh, we need more, more, more data around the Southern Ocean because, because it's far from everyone and hard to get to. And, um, but yeah, it's a good question. Um, I'm going to take Marla's question online, who's asking about CO2. Um, so the oceans and forests are absorbing some carbon dioxide, but isn't that damaging and impacting the oceans and forests? That's a good question, Marla. Um, for the ocean, that's definitely true. The ocean is absorbing CO2, and CO2 itself is, a, is an acid, a weak acid, but it makes the ocean more acidic. So as the concentration of CO2 dissolved in the ocean goes up, the pH goes down, and organisms that make shells or structures out of calcium carbonate have a harder time doing that. So that's... What was that last part? Or Organisms that make sh either shells or yeah. like coral reefs build structures um, out of calcium carbonate, they have a harder time doing that because of the CO2 going into the ocean. So that's a, a closely related but also serious problem called ocean acidification. On land, it's a little bit different. Trees and plants actually grow better with more CO2. So, um, you know, a greenhouse uh, usually traps uh, you know, CO2 and the tomato plants grow a lot better because of the high concentration. Um, so uh, some trees are growing better now than they used to because of the high CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, but the bigger impact is just the changes in temperature and precipitation, so it getting hotter and drier in some places. It's really stressing out the land plants, and that sort of swamps out the, um, the fertilization of the effect of CO2. Any questions? Uh, given that the best laid plans often don't work out, uh, how do you uh, adapt uh, mechanical problems, uh, weather problems and issues, and how does that affect your time and budget constraints? That's a good question. Um, we try to, well, not predict, but we, we, we try to anticipate what types of things that can happen. So going to Punta Arenas, we, know, we knew there's a chance that we would have to evacuate sometimes. So we had some other airports. The closest one happened to be uh, Puerto Montt, that was about two hours away. Um, so we knew there was times we might have to evacuate. I don't think we saw it happening as often as it did. I think there were five evacuations. Um, and so, yeah, that definitely cut down on the amount of research time that could happen. Um, so. Um, generally, these projects are about six weeks long. Um, 
and what what you want is that you can actually get the science done and or you know collect what you need in, in less time and then you've got a little bit of buffer on there um, uh, in case things do go wrong and you've got time to make up those flight hours or, or things like that so yeah I'm going to take Karen's question online um, which is will the a10 warthog ever see its chance to contribute to hail science no, yeah, <laughs> I wasn't anticipating this one. Um, <laughs> short answer is uh, no. There was a there there was a program that was proposed to um, convert an, an A10 into a uh, like a storm penetrating aircraft, um, but due to um, you know budget issues and just the overall logistics of trying to to make that happen, it was um, eventually scrapped and. Um, the plane was uh, moved from RAF, and we haven't seen it now in a few years, but it, it was there for a little while, so. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> you all didn't know you were gonna get a dance show. In the room? Okay, I will take Kyle's question who asked how often will the C-130 flights by the Air National Guard happen? So those flights happen every year, but I think maybe the question is asking how often will we get to measure on them. Um, so we, um, the proposal was to do it for three years and to try and fly um, a couple times. They're flying every day uh, out of McMurdo to join on a couple flights a week. Uh, during our test season, we flew it was challenging with working into the cargo operations, so um, we and COVID was going on, so things were quite stressed um, in terms of being behind on other projects. We got eight flights in um, like a month and a half, uh, and so what we'd like to do, and we're hoping to do uh, when we go back, um, is to is to be flying sort of once a week to Christchurch and back, and once a week to the South Pole and back. Um, and we had proposed to take those planes and fly just with our instrument on a dedicated flight, but that has proved to be too expensive for NSF. So we have to, for now, we have to join the, um, the existing sort of cargo operations. Questions in the room? So we had a question, um, which is, where would you both like to do a field campaign that you haven't done one yet? And then justify the science. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it always works. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You pick the location and then yeah. you say, what could we actually study there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, where would you like to go? Just because you. Yeah, I don't know. You've um, done a lot of places. I mean, Antarctica would be a really cool pin in the map. So um, I'd say, yeah, finding a way to get to Antarctica would be great. So, and there's lots of science you can do there. We, yeah, so I'm, we're trying to do more of those large global surveys again, which go to a lot of neat spots. Um, but um, but if I had to go somewhere and be there for six weeks, there there we have colleagues. We've talked about trying to get the G5 to fly the Equatorial Pacific, and that's hard because the really interesting part of the Equatorial Pacific, from the Earth science perspective, is the easternmost part where um, you have all these upwelling currents and. Actually, it's a long way from land, or at least any land that has an airport where we could operate um, our aircraft. And so, trying to figure out where you know where to base the plane and how to get there is challenging. I will ask you my other question that I had, um, which is: if there are any students who may be watching this live stream and they want to do the things you all do, what advice do you have for them? <laughs> um, I would say there, there's a there's a lot of there, we're not the only group who does um, airborne research. Um, NASA does some. NOAA obviously does. Um, the DOE does. There's also other countries that do it. So um, you can find uh, departments and places that have instruments that will go on board these aircraft. And so. Um, you know, look at some of these campaigns, see where, see where those instruments are coming from, see what you have an interest in, um, you know, maybe try to get into those departments and, and you know, contact those advisors and, um, you know, we might get to see you on a, on a plane at some point, so, yeah. 
I'm, that's strictly like uh, scientific. Um, you know, obviously, if you're uh, studying something else like uh, electrical engineering or becoming an aircraft mechanic, we often have job openings, and so you can you can get in. So yeah. So you need to have like a bachelor's for all of those jobs, or are there other degrees that you will take? Uh, other other degrees for sure. Yeah. So. Yeah, we, cool. we certainly have people who don't who have come through the community college route and, and tech schools and things like that. So yeah, I don't know. Do you have any other advice for students? What got you into? Yeah, this? I well <laughs> right. So I can, I think you know if you find something that you're interested in um, in school in school if it's whether it's science or not there there's really um, endless possibilities for doing you know doing more of it. You can you know major in what you're interested in college, and if you want to, you can go to graduate school and keep working on it. And if you just keep doing what you're interested in, you, know, you may all of a sudden wind up <laughs> with an actual job doing that for, you know, doing that for, your, for your career. So um, that's one of the good things about being in sort of science is that you, know, you get, to, get to pursue your interests. And, um, and uh, I, I like the, you know, the aspect of there being questions that we don't know the answer to. And, uh, it sort of sometimes feels like a really long, slow process, but we we are making making progress on answering them. Um, uh, so that that's satisfying as well. We have a question online from Marla, and she wants to know if y'all and the Ocean Float Instrument team are still respectfully disagreeing over who's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're, we're, we're friends with, you know, we're friends and colleagues, and, and so um, we had thought maybe they had, you know, we're going to find a, a problem quickly and easily, um, and I know they've been looking really hard, um, so, so we catch up every once in a while in meetings, but I think they're still trying to figure out um, uh, if, you know, if there is a problem from their perspective, and if so, if so, what it is. They, they, you know, occasionally one of those floats will go by a ship that's measuring, and so they get a certain number of what they call, you know, crossings that are satisfying some time and space criteria, and they can try and build up, you know, over time enough statistics to actually um, verify things that way. Um, so it's, and there's still, you know, um, NSF funded a more recent project that put 500 of those floats all over the world. So it, 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 the potential is great, and they measure lots of other things um, that, that are, that are um, working well and telling us lots of other things. So it's, it, it's a great project. Um, there's just this trick of getting to CO2 fluxes or CO2 exchange that's, I think, challenging. We have a question from Janine. What? Yes, we promise running too. I promise it's a nice question. Um, where are you hoping to go next? What's on the schedule next? Well, I didn't yeah, really um, allude to it, but it is sometimes quite hard to get proposals funded um, by NSF. We work for an organization that actually gets its base funding from NSF, and that sometimes makes it even harder because reviewers wonder why we should, why NSF should give us more money to go do stuff. Um, and it's competitive. We write proposals to programs where um, we're competing with people who are doing computer modeling or lab studies or, you know, going out in the forest and doing measurements. And, and the people making the decisions have really tight budgets and airplanes are expensive. So often they can't, you know, they could afford to fund 20 other people to go do ground-based stuff or one big airplane airplane campaign. So we've had a couple of proposals uh, over the past few years that have not been successful to do more of those global surveys. And so now we're in a phase of trying to find the right opportunity to, to propose it again. Um, so that's, I, because I, through my analyzing the data, convinced myself that um, those big surveys are really the best way to pin down the, the carbon cycle, that's what I'm pursuing. But Corey's, yeah, sorry. Well, no, yeah. I was just going to say, as far as the, the aircraft go, we have plans right now to take the, the C-130 to Sweden next year for a study over the, the Northern Ocean, so the Norwegian Sea and the um, Greenland Sea. That's not really a, a climate, well, okay, it's, everything's kind of related to climate, right? But this is more of a cloud and um, aerosol study um, that, we'll be, that we'll be flying up there. 
And then the, the G5's next planned project is the solar eclipse next year. So we have a team from uh, Harvard that puts a spectrometer on the G5 and we fly along the shadow of the eclipse and it gets them above the clouds, the aerosols, it also keeps them in the shadow a little bit longer. Um, and so it's, uh, um, having done one of those a few years ago, it's pretty spectacular to see an eclipse from 45,000 feet. So <laughs> I will say that, so, so that, that's the next one's kind of coming up for us. And you'll go on that? I won't be. I won't be on this next one. No, I had. I had my chance. I was on the last one in 2019. Yeah. So. <laughs> Before we move to the question on the room, Sarah had a similar question online, and she wanted to know what new projects were you all involved with. But I guess we got that from that. Yeah, that's kind of what. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the. Yeah, those are the two we're we're actively working on now. Yeah. Now we can go move to your question. Um. Actually, two questions. First is, um, how long does it take to put together a proposal, and second, to whom do you submit them? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, some people can write a proposal in a, you know, a couple days, and it might not be a very good proposal. So what I try and do is, is spend more time. And so this particular project, you know, we probably spent a couple months working on that, just, you know, sharing drafts among the team and trying to, um, develop the mission concept, and sometimes you have an idea for something, but you need to go run a computer model or make a bunch of graphs to kind of make the case for why it's going to actually work. So um, for some of these bigger projects, and um, if, yeah, my, I try not to write too many proposals and just make the few that I do write write a little bit better. The other approach is to crank them out, and that's certainly another, another, another way to do it, and pe some people are very successful at that as well. And then the second part of your question was, where do they go? Who, where do they go? Right. So we can submit. So the you know the U.S. government funds fundamental and applied research through a number of different agencies, and we we can apply to um, NSF or NOAA or DOE or NASA. Uh, the projects that I've led have been through NSF and NOAA and NASA. Uh, NSF and oh, NOAA and NASA. National um, Science Foundation. Sorry, yeah. yeah. So NSF, National Science Foundation, NOAA, the, you probably know the big NOAA building down uh, on Broadway, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and then um, NASA, which has a lot of money for doing things in space, but they actually have an Earth Sciences program that funds aircraft work on Earth. So I was just trying to do the math. How much of the, t so you said something about, it was about two months that you had the aircraft and you were t putting in your equipment and figuring all that out, and then a six week campaign. Yeah. So three, four months for in total that the aircraft was so totally yours. Is it busy most of the time or is it sitting between projects without? Um, there is some downtime. Um, the, the the projects themselves, like Britt has said, they're 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 fairly expensive, um, multi million in most cases to to make everything happen, and that includes you know funding a lot of students and, and everything too, and and um, the the research that goes on. It's not just for that time period; it's for the years after to analyze the data. Um, so they do they do sit. We probably do on a on an average year two to four uh, field campaigns. Um, um, so in the in the time in between, there's work going on on the instruments. There's work going on on the aircraft. They have to be maintained. Then we're also you know doing a lot of that legwork for planning those those next projects as well. Um, so um, yeah, so that kind of adds up. But you're I mean you're right when you look at just the the little bit of time. If we were just doing those, we could do quite a few more. But um, yeah, we could we could be cranking them out. Which <laughs> yeah, that would be that'd be okay. But yeah, the pilots would like to be flying yes. every day <laughs> if they could. Right. Yeah. Um, They'd be all for that, so. What is your annual budget? So I, I'm just guessing maybe you're thinking of the aviation facility specifically, um, or NCARS. Um, I, the NCAR itself has something like seven labs or divisions. Um, the base budget for NCAR is, uh, is a, about $100 million, about 1,000 employees, um, lots of big, you know, 
big facilities that are supported for the university community to request. Yeah. And the, the lab or entity that the aviation facility is in is maybe a $20 million budget, and then I don't know what RAS. I don't know how much RAS is. gets, maybe half of that, maybe maybe 10. And that's for, and, and that's all goes towards like what we call the, the care and feeding of the aircraft. So the, you know, maintaining them, upgrading them when needed, you know, paying the staff to, um, you know, be around and, and help planning these projects. Then when we get the funding for the projects, that's like, that's supplemental on top of, um, of that to actually go out and, and do, the, do the science. And not all of that budget is coming to us. Like I said, a lot of it's going to the, the scientists so they can continue to do research. It's paying salaries um, and things like that. So, um, yeah. I'd like to ask one more question. <clears throat> if it's uh, inappropriate that you answer, I'll understand. Uh oh. We have two schools of thought about <clears throat> global warming. Group of scientists, uh, less known about, claim that humans are not <clears throat> affecting global warming as much as the other group of scientists. As laymen, how do we determine who's right and who's wrong? I, well, I, yeah, I think keeping an open mind and, and trying to get information from as many different sources as possible might be what I would say. I don't myself know any sci of any scientists who are still saying that humans aren't causing climate change. I think that everyone's sort of moved on from that um, that uh, debate. The the what. Y y you know, within the scientific community, the debates are around um, what are the feedbacks going to be in terms of the natural systems accelerating or slowing it down, and what can we do about it? What, what you know, are there ways to get CO two out of the atmosphere? Um, yeah, I mean, I I grew up in a small town in Eastern Oregon where it's quite conservative and a lot of people there, you know, I've gone back and given presentations, ask, you know, tough questions about what, well, you know, what's, you know, what's really happening. And I think it is not, we're in an unfortunate situation that um, a lot of the science has gotten politicized. And as scientists, we can kind of stay in our little science bubble and not, not get involved in that. But, but I think uh, my personal observation is that most people now recognize that the climate is changing, and if you just look at it from kind of a risk mitigation point of view, we really should be thinking about um, what can we do to lower the risks of it getting, you know, much, much worse. Um, and it's, you know, the, the hard part about the problem is that, you know, it doesn't, most of the projections you hear are uh, 50 to 100 years off, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't stop then. The, um, the, the heating that we've baked into the system will keep going for a thousand years if we don't if we don't do something about it now. So, the, t for me, the time scales are really um, important to keep in mind. So, so yeah, I, I yeah I, I I respect everybody's view and opinion, and I do talk to a lot of people who have have different opinions, and I I try to keep an open mind myself and uh, listen to. Other, other news outlets than I ordinarily would. And if you are interested in just sort of general uh, information that um, places like NCAR and NASA and NOAA put out in terms of public, um, public resources to learn more, I'm, I'm happy to share some. Thanks for taking my question. Yeah. Thanks. Um, go ahead. Is there another question? Okay. Let's give Britt and Corey a round of applause again. This was... A great, great chat. Um, so I want to take another time to just like thank you all again for spending tonight with me and us to learn a little bit more about Urban Field Project as part of our Explorer series. I hope to see y'all again in November 8th. It's going to be our last event of the year and it's going to be about water resource management. So if you want to know about water, this is your talk. Um, if you're interested in more NCAR Explorer series event, check out our website for upcoming lectures and conversations. And if you want to see what we did in the past, you can also view recordings of past events. Um, if you are 18 years or older, which 
I think most of us are. Um, please take a moment to um, fill out our three to five minute anonymous survey to help us better understand the impact of our program and how we can improve our next event. The survey will close on September 18th. You can uh, find the survey by scanning the QR code. You can also ask a staff member if you would like to take the survey out of in one of our tablets. But thank you so much for coming here. Thank you for spending your time with me. And please, let's just give a hand again to Corey and Britt.